Well, we do have a list of also rands for Nintendo Power's eighth year, but we don't have a lot of games here as we're coming up on the end of life for the console. So we've got some odd choices here. Spawn is a game which honestly feels a lot more like a Super Nintendo launch title than where we're at now. The platforming is more than a little rough when it comes up. The combat controls are a little above something like your Spartan X, your Kung Fu, but they don't all quite mesh. There, there are some controller-based special attacks and that sort of thing you can do, but otherwise it's more of that straight Spartan X one or two attacks to talk out the dig out your minions style of combat. A great example of this is an early stage where you have to triangle jump along vertical shaft while being sniped at. Now, we had a stretch of triangle jumping earlier with a limited degree of, um, of um, possibility for failure due to reasonably placed platforms that are actually just high enough that you could probably just jump normally. But then we have this next stretch with which is a wider section of the level, a wider chimney, for lack of a better term. And then on top of that, um, a, a further distance to go and big enough that you couldn't just straight jump between the two of them. So, and then you have when you have on top of all of that, you then have the whole matter of you're getting shot at and if you get hit, it drops you back down. It basically can drop you back down the bottom again because it interrupts your, interrupt your momentum. Now, the game does do one thing that's really neat that I like. It has a unique twist of linking your number of lives to your spawn power meter. So you have to balance doing your super moves with, you know, taking a beating. With your meter also getting recharged pretty much most of the way, more or less, at the end of each level. It makes for a very different twist in your conventional live structure. Again, this game isn't perfect, but I do like to try see games trying new spins on these concepts. Now, War 2410 is a rough title to play, partly because this presentation is very basic. It's like at your, you know, Advanced Wars level, but with less mechanical stuff for like healing up units and improvements and that sort of thing and it's not helped by the fact that the game basically mashes the troop reset button between missions so there's no real incentive for skillful play keeping troops alive will get you a better rating but it's not going to get you those troops in the next mission it's not going to level up those troops uh, combat experience you don't get veteran units or anything like that uh, so besides that the story for this game is so bare bones as to add further frustration at this point, we've had Warcraft, which, yes, it does also generally match the reset button between missions, but give you information for what was the motivation beyond between the battles, and you had a story that kept you interested. Same with Doom, and coming up around in the not-too-distant future from this is Command & Conquer, which also does this and has very interestingly fleshed-out characters like, you know, Kane. War 2410? Nothing. On a better note, gameplay-wise, we have Tecmo Super Bowl 3, which is a very great continuation of the series. I'll admit I'm not great at this game in particular, but it feels more polished compared to the earlier games. It's got an ability to quickly, well, not quickly, but to switch between different receivers by toggling between them using two of the face buttons. Though it's not quite at the pass plus button level of the Madden games, which made picking was even picking your receiver even faster. This is actually something of a minor bummer because the game doesn't use the shoulder buttons at all, which I would have liked to have the ability to use that in the game, whether for to as a button you could press for sprinting or for trying to juke your way past an opponents, or again as the setting up the wind up for pass, where it's like you press the button. And then you put uh, the shoulder button, then you press another face button in conjunction with your receiver, something like that. Now, if you've been reading some of my written game reviews on my blog in the not too distant past, like within this same month or previous month, as you're re watching this video, you will know that I hate being forced to drive in the first person in games the majority of the times it comes up. Hated it in Cyberpunk 2077. I hated it in 
Um, Far Cry 4, I hate it. It is anti-fun. And Kawasaki Superbark, my challenge when it makes you do that, there is no exception. I never really got a good grasp of where I was on the track or a sense of distance between where I was and where the turns were, so I could, you know, break and position the bike on the track accordingly to have the right line for going through the turns. And this is before getting into, you know, encountering other racers on the track. It makes for a game that is a bloody obnoxious mess to play. Like, I mean, modern games, for all their faults with how they handle first-person games, it's also through in a 3D actual environment as opposed to through scaling sprites. So there are certain things that could potentially do better at doing you, giving you that 3D driving experience. And also, being if I were to do this in VR, it would probably fix a bunch of that as well if I didn't get motion set in VR. But again, this is a 16-bit console. These are all sprites. Even if the level environments themselves do some try to do some polygonal stuff, they don't do it very much. It all makes for a game that's bloody obnoxious and is a mess to play. It's a bummer because one of my favorite genres is the racing game. So when you make a racing game that is a mess that I hate to play, you make me you hit you make me sad. You make me sad, Kawasaki Superbike Challenge. Why you gotta do that to me? Why you gotta make me sad? Now on a different game, a significantly better game. On the one hand, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Fighting is an interesting fighting game to play because it gives the fights between the Zords and the Kaiju, or between Zords and Zords and Simulator Mode, a degree of speed and mobility that, for example, the Ultraman game that came out of the Super Nintendo's launch did not. Which matters considering that, well, if you watch Ultraman on like Tubi or you bought the Blu-rays or what have you, you know, he Ultraman's a very agile fighter. And if you look at the various Ultra series as time has gone on, and you see an evolution in the fighting style to becoming more and more agile, more and more quick moving as, you know, costume technology has advanced. It's all doubly so if you contrast the Ultra Brothers with, you know, the big G. And I like that this game gives that degree of agility, even if it's not a proper ult, even if it's not Ultraman, that Power Rangers and the Zords tend to be a little more limited in their mo in their mobility due to the design of the costumes. Still, this is a very, very fun to play, but the learning curve was a bit much. I went through like a whole bunch of matches that were pretty straightforward before suddenly getting raffle stopped. And I couldn't quite clear what I was doing wrong with that fight necessarily outside of, oh, we just cranked up the difficulty a punch. Next, we get into a block of two edutainment games, starting off with Packy and Marlin. I was, I was really interested in Packy and Marlin. I have a soft spot for the edu edutainment genre as a whole. That was a, a big chunk of my game playing as a kid was edutainment titles at school, whether it's Odell Lake or Oregon Trail or Carmen Sandiego or that sort of thing. And also, actually, because as someone who has a diabetic parent, and the parent had diabetes when I was a kid, a game about learning to manage diabetes is actually it caught my interest a little bit. And I could see if I was a child of kid, this would be even if, I, even if I was a kid who didn't have diabetes themselves, that this would be a useful game to help them understand what their parents are going, what their parent or what their sibling is going through, and what they're they're doing to manage the diabetes, and give them an understanding to an extent of what that has to do, what that's like. If the game was fun to play, that's the big if here. Is the game has to be has to be fun, and unfortunately, this is an awkward, undirected Amiga-style collectathon. There are so many, so many good edutainment games from the late '80s and early into mid '90s that a game like this one becomes such a disappointment. Now, admittedly, some of the better ones tended to be based a lot more in 
the STEM fields and like math, um, like math related games, math um, munchers um, or n number munchers and that sort of stuff. So I can see to a certain extent that, okay, the things that, you know, the people who design the games are into when they develop games meant to teach those things, they tend to have a certain degree of improvement. I get that, but still, it feels like that this should have been better. This, if this game was better, it would be accomplish its mission much more. And I think it's an important mission to have accomplished. And I hope that somebody tries to do a good edutainment game about diabetes in the future, if they have not done so already. And then there's the other title that we have. Bronchi, the Brontosaurus, from the same publisher, in the same series, about asthma. And this is just a horribly badly designed platformer, and it doesn't do any of the steps that Packy and Marlin does to try and communicate information about diabetes. And it's like... This is like a wisdom tree level bad platformer. It's, it's this game. This game wouldn't have gotten any coverage or discussion in Nintendo Power at all if it wasn't edutainment. If it wasn't trying to educate people on health issues, on important health issues, in spite of utterly, utterly missing the mark. We wrap up with the Super Nintendo and Game Boy versions of Foreman for Real, a boxing game with the license of George Foreman, who at this point was a multi-time world heavyweight champion. He was, a, I believe, recall correctly, the champion when he went into the fight with Ali, the Rumble the Jungle. I could be wrong on this, um, and was in had regained the championship since then, and regained the championship after the rise of Tyson. So, this is a big deal. Like, and boxing was still big at this time, and he was a big deal in boxing. And his, and he'd already established his credibility more than some of the other boxers, like the name of the guy who they got for the Sega Genesis, whose name escapes me. Um, and for Foreman's licensed game to be so terrible is such is so sad because he deserves better like you can't really consistently bob and weave There's something which they show Foreman doing in the opening cutscene um the character designs are really rough it's clear they're trying to do a multi-part sprite thing for each of the boxers like two sprites um for the arms, one sprite for the central body, and then a sprite for the head, and they don't quite have the perspective right for those. Uh, the controls are sluggish when it comes to throwing punches and blocking and that sort of thing, and I never really got a consistent variation on the type of punches I was trying to throw, whether I, whether a hook or a jab or anything of the sort. You, you didn't have, you don't have the science in the sweet science in this game. And on top of that, we got the Game Boy version, which is so much worse because, at l because they tried to do some stuff with all the face buttons and that sort of thing for handle blocking and movement and that sort of thing on the and Super Nintendo and with the reduced number of buttons on the Game, game Boy those control options are gone it's it's a bummer that this game is as bad as this is I would have really liked a legitimately good form and boxing game and this ain't it my pick for this episode is Tecmo Super Bowl 3 it is a decent way for the series to go out as far as the Nintendo consoles, physical consoles, are concerned, um, not including handhelds, and like it's a good, solid game. It spawns okay, but Tecmo Super Bowl, it 
while it doesn't quite utilize some of the gameplay innovation that we, we properly take advantage of by, for example, uh, Madden, or not would be, but have been taken advantage of by Madden, it still works out generally pretty well. Next time, we start Nintendo Power's ninth year, which is the year that we finally get the Nintendo 64. Maybe. Ready, set, put. Interception! Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.